<laughs> it'll be fine. It'll be good. I, I like it too. Yeah. Just uh, the message on it's so powerful. Yeah. Guys, everybody on? Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Let's stand up together. opportunity to come here in your presence on a pristine morning and to lift up your name and to trade our sorrows, trade our sickness, trade our persecutions, trade our pain, all of them for you because you make us stronger and you bring us through those trials and you lift us up and bring us closer to you. We thank you for the wonderful opportunity to come to your table today and to hear from your word. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, to join with each other, to lift up your name, to draw focus on you, and to strengthen us that we may be your hands and your feet in our community. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's no space. That his love can't reach. There's no place that we can't find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. Take me in with your arms spread wide. Take me in like an orphan child. 
child Never let go, never leave my side
With my communion uh, meditations from recently, I've been uh, discussing the blood of Christ. We even put a value on it last time when I mentioned that God did not need a blood bank to cover our sins. Jesus had given all that he had. We can actually estimate the monetary value of Jesus' blood. We can guess that if Jesus happened to have B-negative blood, and 15 pints a person, they'd be worth about, in today's dollars, about $1,500. But we have a better model of the worth of Jesus' blood from, of all people, Judas Iscariot, 30 pieces of silver. At the time of Christ, a piece of silver was probably a shekel of tire. Depending on your sources, it was about a month's wages. So 30 would be about two and a half years of wages. Let's review a part of the well-known events as recorded in Matthew 26 and 27. I'll do some paraphrasing as I go. After Jesus was anointed with very expensive perfume <coughs> from a woman that Judas and others witnessed and wondered about the supposed waste, we then learn in verses 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Soon we learn in verses 21 through 25, 
while the twelve are eating with Jesus, and Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And then the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Judas, who obviously knew what was going on, said, is it not I, Rabbi? And Jesus said, yes, it is. And then we have the first communion. And a little later, Judas does indeed betray him at Gethsemane. But further into chapter 27, we learn when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priest and elders and said, I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. He then threw the money into the temple and hanged himself. And the priest took the money, and knowing that it was blood money, didn't put it in the treasury. But they bought a piece of land called Potter's Field. And it's called, of course, the, the uh, blood field now. But thus they fulfilled the words of Jeremiah. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded. <clears throat> now, I know that's a lot of verses, but one of the points I want to stress is the price of the blood of Christ. Many of you know that I'm a Roman coin collector. This coin is indeed valuable. It's a shekel of Tyre. It's, it's authentic. But as I look at the coin, although it's valuable, how in the world could it be worth the blood of Christ? Or 30 of them? Or 3,000? Just know that indeed, the precious blood of Jesus, as we take communion, really does have value. Precious value. More than we can ever fathom, and certainly more than 30 of these. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word in all of its details. I thank you for the details you give about the blood of Jesus and how truly valuable it is. More precious than any coins ever made in Jesus' time or ours. As we participate in communion, let us keep in mind the sacrifice of Jesus and its infinite value. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Christ the Redeemer died on the cross died for the sinner, paid all his dues. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I Blood, and I 
Jesus loves. Oh, loving kindness, faithful and true. Find peace and shelter under the blood. And I will pass, will pass over you. When I, when I see the blood, see the blood. When, I, when I see the blood. Stand together, please. You know, we're reaching uh, the second part of our series in Jonah that Gary's going to bring to us, and we're about ready to get into the storm. So here we are, a shelter in the time of storm. The Lord's our rock. pray with me. Our Father and our God, we come before you today admitting that we have many failures in our life that we can't overcome. The storms come our way every day and on our own we can't face them, but we thank you that through Jesus we have a rock and an anchor that holds us strong even in the roughest times of life. Father, I just pray this morning that you'll fill this place with your spirit, that you'll touch and speak to our hearts and our lives today, that through your word, Father, you'll encourage us and strengthen us to face whatever storms we face every day. And Father, we just come to you today to thank you for all the blessings of life, our families, our homes, our jobs, our health. So many times, Father, we take it all for granted until, until the storm comes. And then we turn to you because we know you were there all the time. And so, Father, we pray that every word that we speak, every prayer we offer, every song we sing this day would glorify and lift you up and lift up the name of your son, Jesus. For it's in that precious name we pray. Amen. The kids are dismissed to junior church. We've been going the last couple of months over a series of sermons about saying yes to God. And last week we began looking at the final story and we're going to close it out today by looking at somebody that didn't necessarily say yes 
to God. God called Jonah to go to the land of Nineveh. You remember that last week? And to preach against that great city. And what did Jonah do? He went down to Joppa and he went 2,000 miles in the opposite direction toward Tarshish. You can't say no much louder than that. And, 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 and the Bible says that God sent a storm. Now, remember I said last week this was not no accident. It's not a matter of the fact that, that he started in the wrong direction and a storm came up. No, God sent the storm. And I said last week that when you say no to God, you can expect a storm to be coming your way. And, and this was a bad storm. This storm was so bad that even the experienced sailors on board the ship are throwing the cargo overboard. They're, they're throwing away the very reason they're sailing because they're afraid. But where's Jonah in all this? In, in Jonah chapter 1 verse 5, the second half of that verse says, But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. So, so here's what's happening. The, the, the experienced sailors are throwing their belongings overboard. They're crying out to their gods for protection. Meanwhile, inside the boat, unbeknownst to anybody else, Jonah is sound asleep. I mean, he is so asleep that verse 6 tells us the captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. And maybe he'll take notice of us and we will not perish. Now he, he doesn't know Jonah's God, but he knows he needs God. And so he comes to Jonah and he says, I don't know who your God is, but, but if you've ever prayed in your life, pray now because we need help. And I want you to catch this. Jonah says no to God and God sends a storm. And, and what's What's Jonah doing during the storm that God sends to turn him around? He's sleeping through it. To, to the point that the captain of the ship has to come down and shake him and tell him to get up and cry out to God. You know, this is where I think a lot of people find themselves today and they don't even know it. They've said no to God and God sent this storm into their life but they're sleeping. They're sleeping through the storm. As a matter of fact, I really think there ought to be a warning label in the Bible that says something like this. Saying no to God may cause drowsiness. Because saying no to God causes us to harden our hearts. And suddenly we become oblivious to the storms that are all around us. We literally sleep through the storm. So maybe there needs to be a label that says you shouldn't try to operate a family while saying no to God. Or you shouldn't make big decisions in life while you're saying no to God. And an example of this in the Old Testament might be in Exodus chapter 8 when, when Moses goes to the most powerful man in the world in his day, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he says, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And the Bible for the first time says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. And, and, and you know that the plagues go on and, and after the second and the third and the fourth plague, finally, finally it reads this way. It says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. When you choose not to follow God, there comes a day he just gives you over. If that's what you want in life, that's what he'll let you have. And so God sends these 10 plagues on the land of Egypt and the, the, the entire land is destroyed. All the crops and, and finally the firstborn of every family dies and, and, and the land is devastated and Pharaoh keeps saying no because every time he says no, his heart gets just a little bit harder to the point that he can't listen anymore. And that is so 
true? That one of the side effects of saying no to God is, is that every time we say no, it just hardens our heart a, a little more. It puts us to sleep so that we don't even know the storms going on all around us. And God is trying desperately to get our attention, but, but our hearts are getting harder and harder, and he just can't break through. And we just, we just keep sleeping. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I realize and I really feel this, this responsibility every Sunday morning. Part of my job is to grab a hold of you and give you a shake and say, wake up! And so I, 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 I see families at times that are falling apart and, and one mate is really trying. They, they want to make it work, but, but the other one, well, they're just disinterested. They're sleeping. Because when you say no to God, it, it's likely the storm's going to come your way. But the more you continue to say no, the, the, the more, more likely you are to sleep right through it. But, but here's the saddest part. When you say no to God, it affects the people around you, too. The sailors are terrified. Like I said earlier, they're throwing over their cargo. They're, they're throwing over their belongings. They're, 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 they're throwing away their wealth. And the captain is afraid. Because while Jonah may be sleeping, nobody else is sleeping during the storm. They're all scared to death. That they're being devastated by the storm that Jonah caused by saying no. And the people who are all around you are sometimes sometimes forced to live in the storm that you've caused. Did you know that? See, there's, there, there's always this ripple effect when, when we say no to God. We're not the only one that experiences the consequences when we say no. Oftentimes, others do as well. There, there, there was a sermon I heard once. I, 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 I can't even tell you the, the, the whole outline, but, but I can tell you the title because I remember it to this day. Here's the title. How much is your sin going to cost me? In other words, when I sin, I'm not the only one that pays the consequence for that sin. Everybody around me experiences the consequences that come my way. And and, and there may be people around you today who are are being devastated by, by your storm. You may be sleeping. You you might be oblivious to everything that's taken place, but they're not sleeping. I'm telling you right now, they're hurting. And, And there are people sitting right in this room this morning, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe you grew up in a home and, and, and your dad was a workaholic. I mean, he was one of these 70, 80, 90 hour a week guys. He never went to your ball games. He was never at home at night. He never said, I love you. And you did everything you could in life to get that man to affirm you, but he never did. And today, you wonder sometimes if you're worth loving. Or, or maybe your, your mom was one of those people that got angry. You know, she had anger issues. Every day you could count on it. She was going to blow off sometimes. And, and you were walking around on eggshells all the time, not sure what you were going to do, but something's going to set her off. And she robbed you of your childhood. 
And this morning you're sitting here, but, but you got this hole in your heart from somebody else's sin. Or maybe, maybe your parents, one or more, had addictions. And they lied to you over and over again. That they were going to quit. They, they got down on their knees and they promised you, I will never come home this way uh, again. But they did. And now, to be honest, you have a hard time trusting anybody. Or, or maybe it's a pornography addiction that your mate has and it leaves you feeling worthless. Without value. And you've been beat up by somebody else's storm. And so here's what you need to catch <laughs> when you say no to God you might sleep right through it but I, I guarantee this morning the people living with you people in your house in your family they're not sleeping and they're begging you today wake up because there's a storm going on in your life See, it's not me this morning that's telling you to wake up and cry out to God. It's, it's your friends. It's the people you work with every day. It's your family. Because they're hurting too. When are you going to wake up? And so God sends this storm to get our attention. But, but, but the more we say no to God, the more we just sleep through the storm. And so in Jonah's case, the sea was getting worse. The water was getting rougher. The, the sailors were more and more afraid. And finally, they, they said, who's causing this? And the Bible says they cast Lot, <coughs> and the Lot fell on Jonah. And so they come to Jonah, and they said, who are you? And, and I love this answer. Tell us about your God. In, in Jonah 1, verse 9, here's what Jonah answers. I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And just maybe at this point, you're thinking, maybe, maybe Jonah's getting it. He seems to be recognized that, that it's probably pretty futile to try and run away by boat from the God who made the sea. Just maybe he's coming to his senses. But the sailors are still terrified. They said to Jonah, well, what do we do? How do we stop the storm? And Jonah says, well, it's pretty simple. <laughs> Seems like on the cost, throw me overboard. But they don't want to do it. You, you know what? Your friends will fight for you all the time even when you're wrong. Verse 13 says, Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land, but they could not because the sea grew even wilder before them. And so in verse 14, they, 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 they start praying, and here's what they pray. They're praying to Jonas God. Oh, Lord, please don't let us die for taking this man's life. And don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. And in verse 15 it says, And they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. See, I, I, I also want you to see that, well, Jonah said no to God. doesn't mean that God wasn't still at work. Doesn't mean that he wasn't accomplishing his purpose. Listen, you can say no to God today, but in the midst of your no, God's still at work. He, he's still accomplishing what he wants to accomplish through me, you because here's what happens. Suddenly, a revival breaks out on the ship headed for Tarshish. The sailors begin to, to, to make sacrifices and vows to God, Jonah's God. And it's at this point 
where we say to ourselves, oh, okay, yeah, I remember. I know that story, you know. That, that's the story of Jonah and the whale. That's what you've been telling all this time, isn't it? And the whale's name was Monstro, and Jonah was running away from Geppetto because all he wanted really was to be a real boy. I remember this. You know what we tend to do? We tend, if we're not careful, to throw this story in with the fairy tales that we grew up with as, as a kid because, I mean, come on, let's be real. Jonah lived inside the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. Well, first of all, here's what it says in Jonah 1 verse 17. It says, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Now, now there's something I want you to notice here first. It doesn't say anything about a whale, does it? We, we made the whale part up. It, it says that God provided a great fish. And, the, and that word provide means he commissioned or he, uh, he appointed. God made a special fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah lived inside the fish three days and three nights. Now, now listen, I, I, I'll be honest. I'm as cynical as the next guy. But I don't see how this is so hard to believe. I mean, when you look at, at, at the creation all around us today, and you understand that we can make a submarine that you can put 100 people in, and you can send it underneath the water for weeks at a time, is it really so hard to believe that God couldn't make a fish that would keep Jonah alive for three days and three nights? And so God appoints this fish. He, he commissioned this fish. Can, can, can you just, can't you just hear these instructions? I mean, when, when I was thinking about this this week, can, can you imagine God makes this fish and he says, okay, now I got a job for you to do. You see, there's this prophet you're going to find in the water. Now, now here's the important part. Remember this, this next part. Swallow, but don't chew. <laughs> and the fish was sent to swallow Jonah. And in, in chapter 2, Jonah's inside this fish under the sea for three days. And we don't have time maybe to go into all of this today. But, but, but here's what I want you to think about this week. When Jonah says no to God, he ends up in a much more dangerous place than he would have if he just said yes to begin with. I mean, to be honest with you, I, I, I got to believe that even Nineveh beats inside the fish, don't you? But while Jonah is inside this fish, we... We, we, we find him doing something he hadn't done up to this point in this book that we know of. In Jonah 2 verse 1 it says, From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord God. Now, now this is a prophet, the closest we could come today. This guy's a preacher. He ought to be praying all the time. But, but here's what we find. When you say no to God... It seems like sometimes your prayer life struggles. I mean, when you're saying no to God, you really don't feel like talking with him very much. <laughs> you ever been there? You, you know what you're doing is wrong, and you, you, you like to talk to God, and, and you haven't really read your Bible every day like you, because, well, you just don't feel comfortable around him. Jonah 2 verse 2 says, In my distress I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave I called out for help and you listened to my cry. When things couldn't get any worse, Jonah decides, well, I got nowhere else to go. I might as well talk to God. 
And God saves Jonah. But, but, but here's what I want you to see. This is very important. It wasn't very pretty. Jonah chapter 2 verse 10 says this. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up on dry ground. Now you, you don't read the word vomit very often in the Bible. Vomit is not a very pretty word, is it? I mean, vomit is, well, it's one of those junior high words, right? Vomit. (laughs) In fact, here, let me give you a little hint. If you ever get called on at the last minute to teach a youth class, this is probably a pretty good verse to park on. It's going to get a reaction. In fact, you can even go into the Hebrew and it's even more graphic than that, but I won't do that this morning. But, 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 but I, think, I think there's a point to be made here. God rescued Jonah, but, but it wasn't pretty. <laughs> he didn't send an angel to bring Jonah out. He, he didn't beam him magically to the, the, the shore The fish vomits Jonah. It tosses its cookies. It loses its lunch. It it launches the food shuttle. Maybe I shouldn't be talking about that before our picnic lunch today. But but, but that's what what happens. People say God doesn't have a sense of humor. But in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says this. After he vomits Jonah up, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. So, so after this storm, after this three-day wide in the belly of a whale, God comes back and he says a second time, Are you ready to go now, Jonah? And, and really, I can't, think, I can't think of better news today than this. Can you? Because all of us today have tried to ride out the storm at one time or another in our life. All of us today have said no at one time or another, and we've fought the fight, and we hope to make it through the struggle. But it doesn't have to be that way. The word of the Lord says, he came to him again and gave him an opportunity to say yes. And here's what I want you to catch. This is what we need to know as we come to the end of this series on saying yes to God. It is never too late to say yes. Do you know that? Even when you've said no, it's not too late to say yes. In fact, in verse 3, here's Jonah's response this time. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Probably a good idea. This time he gets it right. God gives Jonah a second chance. And this time Jonah says yes. And he goes to Nineveh and he begins to preach that if if they don't repent in 40 days, God is going to destroy y'all. An amazing thing happens. The people in this heathen city who have said no to God over and over in just about every way you can think of, repent. They repent, the Bible says, in sackcloth and ashes. They they, they turn from saying no to God to saying yes to God. And look what, what God does when they say yes to him. In Jonah 3 verse 10 it says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways... He had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. And so at the end of the story, the people of Nineveh say yes to God. And because these heathen people say yes to God, God says yes to them. See, in in this whole series where we talk about saying Yes to God. Here's what's been going on in the background. God has always been saying yes to us. He answers today with that same yes. Will you forgive me? Yes. 
Did you pay the price for my sins? Yes. Can I have a second chance like Jonah? Yes. The problem isn't God. The problem is that there are a lot of people today who think and are afraid to ask. Because I made such a mess of my life. I, I, I've done so many things wrong. God couldn't possibly want me now. But can I tell you something today? If you're willing to say yes to him, his answer is still yes to you. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, the Bible says, we love God. But do you know why we love God? Because he first loved us. And we say yes to God today. Because he said yes to us first. And God is coming to you again today. And he's asking you, will you say yes? Hi, I'm Gary Swick, and I'd like to thank you for listening to the message this morning at Paoli Christian Church. We hope that what you've heard has touched your heart and encouraged you in your walk with God. We would really like to hear from you if you have any spiritual needs that we might help you with. You can contact us by looking for us online at paolichristianchurch.org or by phone at 812-723-2664. Paoli Christian Church is located at 1700 West Hospital Road in Paoli, Indiana. Once more, thank you for listening, and I hope that you'll listen again next Sunday as we worship God together at Paoli Christian Church.